Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our series, Key Battles of World War I. In the last two episodes, we bit off a lot. First, we looked at the Battle of Verdun, which seemed to take the entire year of 1916. It was a battle that went on for, it was 57, six days war. That's my thing. So, and then a uh, hundred battles of Gettysburg. Very long. So yeah. that was a massive battle to bite off. And then we looked at the Naval Battle of Jutland, which seems, if you just look at the numbers, fairly even-handed in the outcome, similar losses among the Central Powers and Allied Powers. But in reality, it was as decisive as the Battle of Trafalgar because the German high seas fleet was driven home and was only put to sea three more times. And these were just minor sweeps. We're going to be moving back to the Eastern Theater and looking at the Brusilov Offensive. And before we get too far into this, James, I just have a question for you. When we look at Russia, and especially when we look at the Austro-Hungarian Empire, they're like a leaky bucket when we look at it in terms of troop losses, especially Austro-Hungary. I can't understand how after every battle, they seem to lose 200, 300,000 troops, then 200, 300,000 more, and it keeps happening and happening and happening. So which do you think is worse to serve in in World War I? That's like saying, would you rather die by <laughs> decapitation or firing squad? I, I wouldn't want to serve in either one. The Russians, they were very poorly led for the most part. They were not very well supplied. And of course, the further they got from their base back in Russia, the, the bigger that problem became. So plus they never had steel helmets. That's kind of a problem. <laughs> but uh Austria-Hungary is also very poorly led. It's better supplied. Plus, you've got the Germans usually helping you out. But, oh, man, you've got the problem <laughs> of the ethnicities. You you know, you might not understand the language of the next guy over, or not the next guy, but the next unit, perhaps. So I don't know. They both lose a lot. I'd say it's a draw, man. <laughs> it's a race to the bottom, and they both hit the ground first. Pretty much. Well, I think if anything World War I is going to show us is it'll wake up a lot of people to the reality that empires simply are not a good means of government. An empire was a perfectly viable way to govern a group of people uh, up until this point. It was very prominent in the 19th century. But afterwards, we're going to see that a lot of people chill off to it until they completely abandon the idea after World War II. And by the 1960s or so, empires completely disappear from the face of the earth. Part of that will have to do with how poorly things turn out when an emperor who's only there because of birthright and no other reason decides to take the reins directly over military command. We're going to see how that works, and it's not pretty. Oh, man. Mm. Well, uh, before uh, James really kicks us off, I just want to give some context of uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. When it starts in 1914, there's 13,400,000 men available for military service. That's just everyone 15 to 49. But when we look at people actually fit for military service, it's a little bit over 9 million. Well, these numbers, as we've already seen in the series, deplete rapidly because the Austrians, that's just the short for Austro-Hungarians if you prefer, they're failing on every single front in the war except against the Italians. The 1914 invasion of Serbia was a disaster. By the end of the year, they'd taken no territory, lost over 200,000 men, over a force of 450,000. Things start out equally bad on the Eastern Front. They're defeated at the Battle of Lemberg, as we saw. In May 1915, Italy joined the Allies and attacked Austria-Hungary. This continued for the next three years, the fight on the Italian Front. And it was the only place the Austrians were effective because they held back the numerically superior Italians in the Alps. But when we get into 1916, when the fortress city of Verdun, France, came under siege, the French are pleading with other allies, Britain and Russia, to mount offenses in other areas against the Germans to prompt them to divide their forces and give them some relief from their struggle at Verdun. So while the British plotted the offensive that they would launch near the Somme River in early July, the Russians are also making plans of their own. So what's happening there with the Russians, James? Okay, well, the Russians had lost a great deal of territory to Germany and Austria in 1915. We'd seen that prior to that, Russia had made some progress, not really in the northern part of the Eastern Front. They were doing terrible there. But in the more southern part of the Eastern Front, around the Carpathians and, and in Austria, Austria-Hungary, they 
captured the fortress of Chemisel and some other key places, but they were immediately taken back. Not immediately, but not long after that, they were taken back. So Russia was on the retreat for the most part in 1915. And of course, they wanted to reverse that. So one of the best Russian generals, probably the best Russian field commander, was a man named Alexei Brusilov. He was given the mission to recapture a lot of the territory in the southern part of, well, actually all through it, all up and down the eastern front. He was in command of the entire theater, and his job was to try to get as much back as possible, really put the squeeze on Austria and even Germany and, and just push them back. So he put together a plan in April of 1916 to launch a major offensive against Austria he wanted to take pressure off of France and Britain, as you mentioned earlier, and hopefully knock Austria out of the war. The Allies realized if they could knock out either the Ottomans or Austria, it would be a lot better. Instead of three major powers versus three, I'm not counting Italy. I, I mean, they played a role, too. They were important. But it's, I'm counting France, Britain, and Russia as the major allied powers, and Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Turkey as the major central powers. If you could just make it three on two instead of three on three, that would be a huge advantage. Brusilov thought if he could attack along a broad front, the Austrians would not be able to use reserves. And in one way, he is able to do this, <laughs> maybe the soft bigotry of low expectations. The others' generals thought that, well, we might as well give you the go-ahead, because what do you have to lose? They had little confidence in Brusilov's strategy. He just figures, well, my attacks will draw troops away from other areas and ensure the success of the offensive in the north. And they figured, eh, whatever, go for it. What do you have to lose? So not a lot of confidence in him at this point. Yeah. Well, they should have had confidence in him, yeah. it, as we will see. Brusilov also wanted to minimize the distance between Russian and Austrian lines. There was a huge gap between the two lines. He thought it would be better to close that in some. All right, so on June 4th, 1916, the Russians launched an attack at 1 a.m. That was awfully rude of them to <laughs> interrupt the sleep of the, the other people. But That's military coup time right there. Oh, man, I tell you. So they launched a 1,900-gun barrage. That's 1,900 big field guns. And they were attacking German positions for the first part. This is, so we're, we're talking about, the again, the northern part of the Eastern Front. And the attacking guns stretched from the Pripyat Marshes all the way down to Bukovina, which is, that's a big distance. The Pripyat Marshes are kind of in the Poland vicinity, whereas Bukovina is down closer to Romania. Instead of advancing right after the artillery barrage, which is typically what you do, they shelled the German positions a second time. Why not? Uh, the Germans had also done this at Verdun. The Russian infantry attacked finally later in the day. By 6 p.m., they had captured several thousand prisoners and one-third of the Austrian artillery. That's not a bad day's work. No. The Austrians retreated. Within a few days, the Russians had taken almost 20 miles of ground. So we see again here that for the most part, the Eastern Front, the fighting on the Eastern Front is very different from the fighting in the Western Front. In the Western Front, as we have seen and we will continue to see, they will spend months just trying to get a mile or two. You know, they'll they'll lose 20,000 guys to get 100 yards or, I don't know, 200 yards or some ridiculously tiny amount of territory, whereas the armies are moving a lot back and forth on in the East. So we see 20 miles. If, if anybody in the Western Front could get 20 miles, they would just be overjoyed. But that's not going to happen, at least not for a while. Uh, in the north, several thousand Austrians fled or surrendered, and they ceded about 50 miles. So again, we're seeing the Russians are really making some ground here. Things are looking grim for the Austrians. By June 12th, the Russian army had captured about 3,000 Austrian officers, 190,000 common soldiers, 200 heavy guns, and 650 machine guns, and 200 howitzers. A howitzers is just like a artillery piece that shoots a really high up in the air shell that comes right crashing back down. Uh, they also took large numbers of supplies and ammunition. I never cease to be amazed, Scott, by these numbers, these huge numbers. They captured almost 200,000 soldiers. That, that's just, that just so dwarfs anything in the civil war or especially the revolutionary war. It just, you know, oh, what? 200,000 more gone. Staggering. Right. I mean, we throw out those numbers, but I mean, what would it look like to march columns and columns and columns of soldiers out of the battle? 
How long would that take? Hours, days? Days, and, and the line would be miles long. It's just the mass of humanity that's um, that they're dealing with is just incredible. All right, so in the north, where the Russians are primarily fighting the Germans, a minute ago I said the north, but I really kind of meant the center. You have the, uh, the northern part of the eastern front where it's Russia versus Germany, the southern part of the eastern front where it's Russia versus Austria, and in the middle it's Russia versus a combination of Austria and Germany. Uh, now, so in the north, again, where the Russians are fighting the Germans, they push the Germans back 30 miles. But here's a common problem in just about every war, and Russia is especially susceptible to this. They had outrun their supplies. They, they couldn't keep the weapons coming, the ammunition coming, food and everything else that they needed, medical stuff, so they had to temporarily halt the attack. They had also lost several hundred thousand casualties. Again, these huge numbers, just, we keep saying them again and again, but just every single time we say it, just think of so many people either getting killed or wounded. And was there an arrogant commander, Scott, on the <laughs> side of Austria-Hungary perhaps involved with some of this? Yeah, one could say. I just have to say, when it comes to a system of government or leading a military, birthright is not the way to do it. We're going to see that with our good friend, Archduke Joseph Ferdinand, who is leading the Austrian troops at Lutsk. He is very confident, but much like his counterpart, Tsar Nicholas, are they cousins? I, I get all these emperor cousins mixed up. Uh, not sure what the relationship <laughs> okay. is there specifically. If we just assume yes, um, the answer is very close to it. Uh, it's hard to remember who is and isn't related and all these different things. But he unsurprisingly does a terrible job. And before we get a little bit further into uh, a next wave of attacks, in the beginning, Austria-Hungary outnumbers the Russians, 200,000 men against 150,000. The first barrage that James mentioned obliterates his advantage completely along with the Austrian front line collapsing. In one day, Brusilov took 26,000 prisoners. In two days, the 4th Army was broken, and this loss effectively ended Joseph Ferdinand's career. There were hundreds of thousands of prisoners captured, and this forced the Austrian commander, Konrad von Holzendorf, to close down an offensive against Italy uh, in order to uh, divert guns and divisions back east. Conrad told his German counterpart, Eric von Falkenhayn, that they were facing the greatest crisis of the war. Uh, and Falkenhayn didn't like this because they were close to the French surrender at Verdun. So this is what causes some uh, German divisions in the West to have to focus to the East. And we saw a couple of episodes when the momentum shifts to France's favor in Verdun it's because of these German divisions being called out. And that's, this is what's happening. This is what causes them to be called out. Mm -hmm. So just wanted to throw that in real quick. Yeah, everybody keep in mind that Verdun is going on at the same time as this. So it's a balancing game for the Germans. You know, do we send more guys east or do we keep them in the west? That It's really kind of a, I don't know, it's almost to me, Scott, a no-win scenario. They kind of need a miracle because they're being hit on both sides and they're constantly shuffling troops around. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. I'm Scott from the History Unplugged podcast. History can be a bit of a tongue twister with its weird sounding names of people, places, and things, but it really isn't that confusing. History is the story of who we are and how we comport ourselves while soaring to victory in battles over forts, seaports, and cities that fortunately thwarted the schemes of villains and their blood sports, like the 1415 Battle of Agincourt. It's about legal battles in courts, about the contortion of torts over the retorts of consorts that turned into kangaroo courts. I exhort you to listen to History Unplugged on the podcast player of your choice, and you can listen to it while wearing shirts, shorts, skirts, skorts, or jean jorts. They were some of the most powerful men who've ever lived. They waged war, forged peace, and altered the fates of billions of people. And yet, they were just as human, just as flawed as you and me. They were the presidents of the United States, and they are the subjects of the history podcast, This American President. In each episode of This American President, we explore how flawed men have managed this awesome responsibility. To listen now, go to ParthenonPodcast.com or search This American President on your favorite podcast platform. Once in a generation, a podcast comes along with the power and eloquence to inspire us all. This show will entertain you while you wait for that one. Join two best friends, author and former history teacher John Driver and comedian Johnny W. for hilarious and authentic conversations about life, 
history, culture, faith, and everything in between. You can listen to Talk About That wherever you find your podcasts or at lifeaudio.com. Makes you wonder with the Schlieffen plan, the idea to quickly knock France out of the war and then focus on Russia. Did they have any contingencies? Did they have a backup? They really should have. They should have. No, they put all their chips on the table, you know, <laughs> all in. I mean, they have a lot, they have a great hand with uh, all of their resources and everything, but a bit off more than they can chew, as we're seeing as this goes on. Yeah, and on the Schlieffen plan, it, it, they made a lot of incorrect assumptions, uh, maybe the most two, the, the two most important of which are, number one, the fact that they thought they could get in and knock out France in about six weeks. That was incredibly idealistic and unrealistic. And and then they also thought Russia would take a long, long time to mobilize and be ready to fight. And Russia surprised them by mobilizing much quicker than they had thought. Nobody's knocking anyone out of the war easily. That does happen, but this is over a course of years. Even the weakest players in this game, the Ottoman Empire, hold on for a few years in World War One, And people are pretty resilient here, if that's any credit to the armies involved. I think it is. And I just think that you you can't just knock out with one blow a, a huge nation with millions of men in uniform. I, mean, I just, I don't, I thought it was, I think it's very unrealistic of them to have thought that, but of course I've got 2020 hindsight. Who knows? <laughs> I mean, Austria, maybe they just simply were using an old paradigm. It's a problem that generals always fall into. I don't know how you can not fall into it of fighting the last war. Right. Nobody can see the future. So we have to keep that in mind, but they couldn't have an envisioned an engagement like this, like World War I. Maybe they wouldn't have thought that the Americans would be supplying the Allied forces. People would commit as much resources and manpower and commit to total war in a way that humanity had never seen before. Before this in the 19th century, you had the Franco-Prussian War. I don't know what else would have been the biggest battles on the continent. Uh, Balkan Wars, maybe. But relatively speaking, small little flare-ups. Uh, so mm-hmm. maybe they just never thought that they're opposing their enemies would have committed so many resources. Hard to tell. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess we'll see what happens in the next wave. That is only the first wave. So what happens in the second wave? All right. On July 2nd, uh, a major force, a Russian force under a general named Alexei Evert. uh, He's one of Bruce Love's subordinates. They launched an attack, but they were not fully prepared. Communications were poor, non-existent, and the, the attack really didn't do much. It kind of fizzled out. The Austrians, backed by a German corps, and that's, again, we were talking about that earlier, that the Germans keep having to come in and bail out the Austrians. The, the Germans famously said that they felt like they were shackled to a corpse. <laughs> you know? So, uh, and it, I, I think if the Austrians had been able to hold their own without having to constantly get German help, maybe the Germans might have had that breakthrough in the West. But alas, that is not what happened. So the Austrians, with German help, fight the Russians off. The Russians took 80,000 casualties in this attack. They inflicted only 16,000. So that's, that's not, a good, not a good day for Russia. The second wave is not off to a good start. But in the north, they were doing well. Brusilov pushed the Austrians back another 100 kilometers. I don't know why I have that in metric, but <laughs> my source must have been a metric source. That's, I guess that's about six, a little over 60 miles. Yeah. In late July, Hindenburg and Ludendorff took charge of the Austrian front. Now, in our episode on Verdun, we talked about how they also took command there. And you may think, well, how could they be in personal command of both the East and the West? Well, they hadn't gone to the West yet at this point. This is July. When they go to Verdun, that's later in the year. So um, they take charge. And, of course, remember, these. this is kind of the dynamic duo of German generals Hindenburg is kind of the, I don't want to say figurehead, but he was almost the figurehead. Ludendorff was really the guy who was really doing most of the decision making. And Hindenburg would just kind of say, yes, okay. Um, But of course, the buck does stop with Hindenburg. But anyway, when they come to take charge, that is a definite advantage for the central powers. On July 28th, there was another massive Russian attack. It drove the Austrians back even more. One Austrian unit, which is the 4th Army alone, lost 15,000 men in one day. That was 60% of its strength. The Austrian forces were losing their will to fight. And there were a lot of units in the Austrian Army that 
were starting to desert and even defect uh, to the other side, like Czechs, for example. Uh, they would. Th why? Why would a Czech want to fight for this empire, the Austro-Hungarian Austro-Hungarian Empire, that is basically having keeping them in the country by force? They felt like they had much more in common with their fellow Slavs, the Russians. Uh, Russian commanders did a poor job of coordinating their attacks, and this allowed the Austrians and Germans to shore up their defenses. So the Russians, in spite of their successes, are still not able to really achieve a, a major breakthrough or a crushing victory. Another factor here, and we'll talk a lot about the air war in our next episode, but German control of the skies allowed the Germans to bomb Russian positions and force them onto the defensive. The German air force was much stronger than the Russian one. Finally, by September 20th, the Russians called off the offensive. Um, so they'd made a lot of gains, but could they be able to hold them? That was going to be doubtful. German Marshal Hindenburg wrote this. He said, all we know is that sometimes in our battles with the Russians, we had to remove the mounds of enemy corpses from before our trenches in order to get a clear field of fire against fresh assaulting waves. So that's how bloody this battle was. There, there's so many people dying, so many dead bodies that they're piling up and you can't even see over the mounds of dead bodies. And one other little interesting side note that is a, a kind of a uh, an effect or, or a result of this. It's influenced by this. And that is that on August 17th, Romania joins the war on the side of the allies. Both sides had courted Romania. Romania was, a, had a key position. It was very close to, it was right next to Russia and it was right next to Austria. And you actually had ethnic Romanians living in the Austria, Austro-Hungarian empire in, in Hungary. So Romania joins and they hope to get additional territory. The next month, they invaded Transylvania, which is part of Austria-Hungary at that time. I believe Count Dracula commanded a division in that. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But, He's sharpening um, his different pikes to impale people. Yes, so. the secret undead army that nobody ever reads about, but we've got it here for you, folks. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, when Romania came in on the side of the Allies, Emperor Franz Joseph is said to have cried, The war is lost! Uh, he, he knows how to inspire confidence in the troops. So he is like, oh, yeah, great. He, he's a military commander. He's a statesman. He inspires people like Winston Churchill. He's a full package, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, he's he's just way past his prime. And he's he's getting upset about Romania, which is a tiny country coming in. We'll see in the future that Romania's decision to join the allies is not going to work out well for them at all. But for now, there they go. And it just felt to the Austrians that were surrounded, right? We've got Russia. Now Now Romania's in. Uh, of course, they had taken out Serbia and they had Bulgaria on their side. So it wasn't hopeless. All right. So that is the Brusilov Offensive. We'll go into the results in a minute. Did you want to add anything, Scott? Uh, I'll just follow up after you mention the results to okay. give context of how bad our friend Austria-Hungary is doing. It's not a super complicated battle with a million moving parts like, say, Verdun, but uh, or I guess you, you, know, you could probably go into a lot more detail than we have, but, but we didn't. So here's the results. Austria, Hungary, and Germany to combined took almost a million casualties in this offensive. Just another huge bloodbath of a battle. It's a huge, epic battle. And keep in mind this again. This is going on at the same time as Verdun. Uh, although it's much shorter than Verdun. And also the Battle of the Somme, which we will talk about in a couple of episodes, is also going on. So we've got in the summer of 20... Okay, there I go again, Scott, 27, 2016. Nope. For some reason, I want to make this war 100 years later than it really was. But in the summer of 1916, we have three of the largest battles ever fought in the history of the world going on simultaneously in different places. But... but uh, you know the, the the central powers are bleeding as well as the allies. Russian cal I'm sorry, Russian casualties were considerable. Again, we have no idea how many exactly. It was anywhere from half a million to a million, and uh, there were some territorial changes too, right, Scott? Yeah, absolutely. And one other thing too, when I mentioned at the top of this episode that in 1914 the Austro-Hungarian Empire had a little over nine million men fit for military service, and then over 13 million available for military service. 
Throughout the war, they are a barrel with holes in it, leaking water or just leaking numbers. And they finally reached their end point after this, where the Austro-Hungarian Empire lost so many that um, they were debilitated. They never played a significant role in the war again. All they would really be able to do was hold trenches against the Italians. And Germany, it was shackled to a corpse before. Now it doesn't really have that even. If I suppose Austro the Austro-Hungarian Empire, if nothing else, was a buffer that would slow down the advances of Russia until they could catch up and help them. Yeah, they're not shackled to a corpse anymore. It's more like shackled to a skeleton. <laughs> there's not, not much meat left and meat and bones and muscle. I mean, right. there's bones, but anyway. <laughs> That's about it. No muscle. Uh, so this is huge for Russia. Uh, they secure more enemy territory than any other allied offensive on either front. Uh, we'll see how long that lasts. But uh, So what this does is um, the June 4th attacks start a string of victories against the Austrian army across the southwest southwestern portion of the Eastern Front. So Germany had to abandon plans for their own 1916 offensive in France to bail out their ally. And they also confronted a new British offensive at the Somme, which we'll also see later. So Russia's resources were also dwindling. Things are also bad for them. The Rusilov offensive basically reached their limits and it was shut down on September 20th. Uh, so it cost the Austro-Hungarian army, I think... Um, Something like 400,000 prisoners taken uh, cost the empire 25,000 square kilometers of territory. Really rough business. Um, so this is the main thing happening on the Eastern Front in 1916. Uh, any other thing you want to add to this before we close things off, James? Yeah, the Brusilov Offensive is considered as one of the most lethal offensives in world history. Uh, as I, I already basically touched on that, but just – Another massive battle, major body blow to both Austria and to uh, Russia. Now, I will say that the Brusilov offensive was probably, if not definitely, the high point of the Russian effort during World War I. <laughs> I hate to spoil it for you folks, but I imagine most people know what's eventually going to happen <laughs> in 1917. I won't say it right now, but let's just say... Russia, uh, things are not going to get better. This is the high water mark. Things are going to start to go into a tailspin for Russia after this. And the offensive, to be fair, I mentioned earlier that the I said that the Russian army was not very well led in general, but but here this was an example of good leadership and good planning on the part of the Imperial Russian army. And there was also very a good effort on the part of the lower ranks. So it wasn't just the top generals that get uh, kudos for this battle. The the people like your colonels and your majors and your captains and all that, they did a great job too. And one thing that helped us succeed so much is that the there was an improvement in the quality of Russian tactics. Rusilov used smaller, specialized units to attack weak points in the Austro-Hungarian trench lines and to blow open holes for the rest of the army to advance into. So focusing on really finding weaknesses and and capitalizing upon those. This is a remarkable departure from the human wave attacks that had dominated the strategy of all the major armies until that point during World War I. So again, instead of just, let's just send a huge, gigantic, several mile long line of thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of guys and just overwhelming by brute force, which that doesn't work as we've seen already. Uh, let's let's focus on the weaknesses and pick them apart one at a time. So that's part of the reason the offensive succeeded. So that's all I got. This is uh, things are looking better for Russia on the Eastern Front, but again, is it going to last? Well, okay, I already kind of gave up. <laughs> I kind of gave that away. Dude. I, don't, I don't. It's not going to last. We'll see what happens. We can't avoid spoilers when we're talking about something over a hundred years ago. It's tricky. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. This is uh, the high water mark for Russia. If we can consider it that way, and let's give them credit. They were smarter in their tactics. They weren't doing a massive magnified pickets charge like what was happening in the Western Front, so they're making progress. One thing James alluded to earlier in this episode was the superiority of German air reconnaissance. So in the next episode, we're going to step out from our battles. This was battle number six. And we're going to look at the air war, dogfighting, aerial reconnaissance, and the rapid evolution that happens with aircraft. 